I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining our uh, webinar today. Um, <clears throat> today we've got uh, Daniel Kramer talking about failure and adver adverse events related to implantable medical devices, risks, and responsibilities. Um, today, if you have any questions during the webinar, please uh, use the Q&A function um, to ask your questions, and we'll answer those at the end of the presentation. Um, so Dan Kramer, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Kramer studied philosophy at Brown University prior to earning his MD from Harvard Medical School and MPH from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He completed internal medicine training at Massachusetts General Hospital and fellowships in cardiovascular disease and clinical cardiac electrophysiology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, as well as the Medical Device Fellowship Program with the FDA. He is a member of the Cardiac Electrophysiology Service at BIDMC, where he leads the electrophysiology and digital health section in the Richard A. and Susan F. Smith Center for Outcomes Research in Cardiology. Dr. Kramer is an associate professor in medicine at Harvard Medical School with additional faculty affiliations at the HMS Center for Bioethics, the Marcus Institute for Aging Research, and the Brigham and Women's Hospital Program on Regulation, Therapeutics, and Law. Dr. Kramer's research focuses on ethics, policy, and clinical outcomes related to the use of cardiac devices with funding support from the Harvard Catalyst, Paul Beeson Scholars Program, Greenwall Faculty Scholars Program in Bioethics, and the National Institutes of Health. So welcome, Dr. Kramer. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, let me share my screen. All right. Can you see that all right? Great. Awesome. Um, great. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this webinar. Um, I'm Dan Kramer. I'm an electrophysiologist, as you've heard. And I'm going to talk about the manifestation of adverse events and device failure related to implantable devices. There we go. Um, so the goals for today are just to understand some of the clinical manifestations of medical device malfunction using um, cardiac devices as sort of the template. I'd like to review some opportunities to communicate sort of both what we know and what might be emerging risks related to these devices used in patients. And then at the end, I want to talk a little bit about something that I'm still sort of uncertain about myself, which is how to think about the financial and ethical responsibilities of uh, different stakeholders when patients experience harm for medical device malfunction, particularly permanently implanted medical devices. And, and just one last sort of additional goal, I think in an, in an audience like this, there's a fair chance that some of you or maybe one of your loved ones might be living with an implantable device, including some of the things I'm going to be talking about today. And it's not my goal to make anyone nervous. So these are amazing life-sustaining devices. They're used successfully by millions of patients every day. And for the most part, they work incredibly well, so much so that they're basically invisible. Um, so I just put that out there to set some background and reassurances. I'm not in any way suggesting that these devices are unsafe or understudied or somehow harmful to use. And certainly things can go wrong, but by and large, year on year, they do not. So I just want to set that to the background and reassurance, hopefully, for anyone who might be personally affected by the technology I'm going to discuss today. These are my disclosures, which are things that uh, Paulina already described, mostly public funding and some foundation support. All right, so just to make sure we're all kind of on the same page about the technology I'm going to describe is most of my research focuses on implantable defibrillators. And these are remarkable devices. They've been around for about 40 years. And one of the things I find amazing about a defibrillator is that the original design shown in this picture on the upper left is pretty much what we still use. A lot has changed about the devices to be sure, but the basic setup has not really changed. There's what we call the generator, or sometimes sh shorthanded as the CAN, this uh, unit that con contains the battery, the software, the circuitry, all the programming and software that uh, directs how the device functions. And it has to be attached to the heart through one or more wires that are directly in contact with the heart muscle. And in this old tracing from one of the very early prototypes, you see what the device is designed to do, senses heart muscle function beat to beat 100,000 times a day. And if the patient's heart uh, beat goes into a sudden dangerous fast arrhythmia like shown here. This is ventricular fibrillation and would be life-threatening. The device is designed to recognize that charge and then deliver a life-saving shock that restores the rhythm back to normal. And the cartoon on the right shows 
more or less what the modern system looks like. So it's been downsized from the original technology from 40 years ago. It's much easier to implant, it used to require an open chest procedure. Now it's done through a predominantly outpatient procedure, um, excuse me, uh, through just a small incision in the shoulder. But the basic setup is pretty much the same. There's a generator that sits under the skin up by the shoulder, and then a wire that follows the blood flow back into the heart and screws into the heart muscle here. This is a chest X-ray showing just sort of what the modern system looks like for the most commonly used design. So there's this device that goes through a small incision near the shoulder, sits underneath the skin just above the uh, chest muscles. We look for the blood vessel underneath the collarbone here. We follow that uh, back into the heart. And then there's a little screw at the tip here. And that's actually how the wire um, remains connected to the heart muscle. And when it works, there's really few things that I participate in as a clinician that are more satisfying than reviewing these recordings with patients or even their families. And this is a recording that's actually made by the device itself. It stores a huge amount of information day to day, year to year. Uh, and this is actually a tracing showing a patient's life being saved by one of these devices. So the purple line is the signal seen by that wire touching the patient's heart muscle. And the green line is that same event uh, recognized by sort of like a simulated EKG between the patient's shoulder and between their heart. And what you see is that there's a couple of normal heartbeats, and then the patient suddenly goes into this very fast rhythm, which uh, several seconds later, the device decides is important enough to deal with. It charges, and then here at this green line, it delivers a shock and restores the patient's rhythm back to normal. So when this works, it's really incredible. Uh, well, what can go wrong? The wires have traditionally been thought of as the weak link of these systems. So the wires that go all the way from the shoulder screw directly into the heart muscle. And they're really kind of small miracles of engineering because the wires themselves actually contain several components all packed into the diameter of about a ballpoint pen. And in this cartoon cross-section, you can see all the stuff that's going on here. There's these um, smaller wires, which are the high voltage conductors. This is what delivers the shock. There's this uh, larger one, which is what does most of the sensing. It's uh, keeps track of the signals that are present with every heartbeat. It's also where that screw mechanism derives from that allows the wire to be connected to the heart at all. Each of these things has to be surrounded by a um, high tensile sort of plastic polymer and then embedded in this insulation so that the high voltage stuff doesn't touch each other. And then in this particular version, there's some redundancy here to allow the, device, the wire to do this. It has to flex 100,000 times a day every time your heart beats. And the whole thing gets coated in something else to protect it from the blood pool and sort of surrounding structures in the body. <clears throat> and these are cross sections of the probably worldwide, the two most popular models that are still used now. And you can see these sort of high voltage conductors embedded in some high tensile plastic and then surrounded by like a little uh, blanket of, um, in this case, silicone that kind of insulates it from everything else that's around it. This is another version that looks pretty similar, slightly different design, but same basic idea. So these are remarkable. They're subjected to all kinds of preclinical uh, and uh, postclinical testing to make sure that they work. Uh, but sometimes things do go wrong. And some of you who are involved in cardiology or maybe have been following medical device um, regulation for years might remember some very high profile recalls that were related to these devices maybe 10 to 15 years ago. And this affected hundreds of thousands of patients and in very rare cases did lead to patient death. So these were widely reported both in the medical literature and in the popular press. So what was actually happening, and you know, a qu common question that comes up is, why did we only know about this after a few hundred thousand clinical implants? And one problem here is, uh, it's really a statistical or maybe epidemiologic one related to the competing risks for the population who receives these devices. So these are usually patients who uh, are at risk of dying suddenly for other reasons. They might have strokes or blood clots, heart attacks, progressive heart failure, or die from other things, particularly for patients who are older and just are subject to things like malignancies or advanced organ dysfunction. And defibrillators don't treat any of those problems. So those patients might pass away suddenly and we would never know if their device was working or not. And these patients also just can be lost to follow up like any other patient or not monitored as closely as we might have preferred. So some categories of actual or impending device failure can actually be completely subclinical and very hard to know about at all. It can be really hard to identify when something's wrong. But in this case, there was a group of investigators uh, in Minneapolis, who just noticed clinically that more patients who had gotten this new model introduced in 2004 of a defibrillator lead were showing up with broken wires, and they manifest as a fracture, which means that one of the conductors, the, the uh, most commonly the part of that wire, which is here, uh, that is designed to sense the heart muscle signal, 
was breaking. And when that happens, uh, a few things can happen that will interfere with the way the device paces patients. It also can be, um, it can cause noise on the signals that the defibrillator sees. And that's unfortunate because the defibrillator will interpret that signal as a dangerous arrhythmia and deliver a shock that the patient didn't need. And in some cases, that inappropriate shock, as we sometimes call it, can actually be fatal. So what they did just a few years after they started to use this device clinically, they um, amalgamated their experience and identified that there was a strikingly deviant um, failure rate of this model called the Sprint Fidelis model compared to the workhorse lead from that same manufacturer that they had been using at the time. In fact, we still use now. Uh, it sort of begs the question maybe of well, what would be the accepted risk of device failure from which this would appear to be deviant? Uh, lower the better, of course, but this was clearly an outlier compared to the experience that had been clinically accepted at the time. This is a, another sort of very different failure mechanism for defibrillator leads. This was a different manufacturer and a different kind of experience. And so this is a test x-ray showing a defibrillator lead sort of viewed kind of from the side of the patient. Uh, this is the kind of data with the liver, this is the spine, and this is the defibrillator wire coming down and screwing into that patient's heart muscle. And you can see that there's sort of this little extra piece that looks like it's outside the body of the lead. And when we removed this broken wire from that patient, this is what it looked like uh, kind of out on the operating room table. And that indeed is what happened. And this particular failure mechanism, which also generated a worldwide recall, affected a few hundred thousand patients. There was a defect in that stuffing, the stuff that kind of surrounds all of the high voltage conductors in the wire. And these conductors can sort of work their way through out of the wire into the blood pool. And it doesn't necessarily mean the wire won't work, but it's, uh, it's not ideal. And so we, uh, this led to a lot of these devices being removed even after the recall was issued, unfortunately, after several hundred thousand patients had had them implanted. And so this sort of begs the question of like, how do you recall something that's permanently implanted, right? It's an unfortunate sort of terminology that we're stuck with and it overlaps with the way we sort of talk about toasters or car seats, um, because you can't recall something that's permanently implanted typically without uh, subjecting the patient to another surgical procedure. And in some cases that's relatively straightforward, but in some cases it's not. So this is a defibrillator lead that I extracted. Uh, so we removed it from the patient through a surgical procedure after it had been in there for you know 10 or 12 years. And this is zooming in on like this red and white stuff. I, I promise this is the last picture with any gore on it, but this is scar tissue that forms around the wire when it's in that blood vessel for years and years. And this scar tissue is what makes removing this difficult and potentially risky. There's a low single digit percentage chance of uh, a catastrophic complication when you do this procedure. Uh, so recalling a permanently implanted device, it's the kind of thing that patients uh, recoil at when they hear that lingo because it doesn't really resonate with how we often think about recalls in a more colloquial sense. So identifying lead malfunction is still actually kind of a, a challenge. And as I said, finding a, a clearly defined and accepted rate is difficult, but it's essential for communicating to patients as well as their other clinical care team members before we implant the devices and then when a problem arises. Um, so I participated in a couple of studies that attempted to do this in different ways. And the figure on the left is pooling data across several centers, looking at how, in this case, it was one of that, that um, lead that was recalled in 2007, how its performance after about a year or so really started to strikingly deviate from the lead that it was being compared to and the one that's still on the market. But it required several thousand patients followed for several years to figure this out. A second study that I contributed to looked at the incidence of lead failure for those two recalled models the Fidelis one, which was the first one I described, the Riata was the model that had this problem with the conductors kind of pushing their way out of the insulation. Uh, and then three models from three different manufacturers that we still use today. And I think one of the um, benefits of this, this pool data from about 20 or so, or maybe 50,000 patients, is that the estimates that we came up with for what even the leads we still use, how often do those fail year to year, it's about a, it's a fraction of a percent. And I sort of tell patients it's in the 0.2 to 0.5% per year range, which is low and year to year, it's certainly small, but it's not zero. And we want these patients to live with these devices, we hope for years, if not decades. And communicating that risk uh, to patients, I think is important, but it's hard to do well. Uh, one of my colleagues did a survey several years ago applied only to cardiologists. In fact, cardiologists who are part of our heart rhythm professional society. And in the survey, he sort of tested their thresholds for replacing devices under certain um, hypothetical circumstances where the device might be malfunctioning or subject to recall. Uh, 
And what he showed was exactly what he was worried about, which is that uh, even cardiologists, even those who ought to know better, actually dramatically overestimate how reliable these devices are. So they're very, very good, but they're certainly not perfect. Uh, this graph integrates a lot of different inputs to just sort of describe again how difficult it is to leverage typical regulatory mechanisms like post-market registries uh, mandated by the FDA to figure out when there's a malfunction in a device like this that usually works well, uh, that's sort of an outlier compared to other technology. So there's a lot in this graph, but I think it's interesting. So the y-axis shows statistical power, how likely you are to detect a difference that you think is important at different sample sizes shown on the x-axis, so 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, et cetera, patients. And that's for how much power at what sample size do you have to identify an important difference statistically between two different defibrillator leads that are on the market. And the two different color lines uh, refer to how long you studied the population. So the longer you study a population, the more likely you are to find that there's a problem. So you get, for a given sample size, more power with the light gray, which is the five-year study, compared to the dark gray, which is a three-year study. And what the FDA mandates is something like, you know, three to five years, three to 5,000 patients in that neighborhood. You can see that doesn't get you very much power to actually detect anything. Um, what you really need, if you want to find um, the different, the dotted line versus the uh, solid line incorporates other assumptions about whether the deviant lead is the market leader or a new entrant to the market. But either way, the sense you get here is that you need like 10 to 15,000 patients in general to identify an important problem and you need to follow those patients for years. And this graph doesn't even account for other issues like dropout or crossover or competing risk or other statistical issues that in most real world studies adds another you know, 10 to 15% to your sample size. So this is a, a problem and I, I don't think it's one we actually yet have a good answer to. It's really hard to figure out even at national scale when one of these devices is malfunctioning before it's been used in hundreds of thousands, if not more uh, patients. Well, what about the generators, the part that sits up by the shoulder and, and does most of the heavy lifting from a battery and uh, software perspective? Because a lot of attention has been paid to leads and deservedly so for the reasons I showed, but actually in the most recent years, generators have been more of the problem and, and that's not entirely new. This is a table that shows the sum of the recalls affecting leads and generators over the past decades and how many patients were affected. So it, it's in the millions over the decades that we've been using this technology. And generators can have recalls that might be related to software issues or firmware, manufacturing problems. And just like the leads, this can be hard to detect because again, they're used in older, sicker patients many times. And who necessarily would think of device malfunction if a patient like that dies suddenly or, or it's found uh, passed away at home? There's actually one interesting study done in Sweden that tried to characterize this more quantitatively. It was intended to be more thought-provoking than definitive, but in this case, they, explant, they took the defibrillator generators that had been explanted by morticians after patients had passed away. And these are typically removed uh, by morticians before patients are cremated because the devices will explode in the um, crematoria, which can be dangerous. So they took about 150 of these and found through their um, analysis of the devices that device malfunction might have been related to the mechanism of death for like two to 3% of the patients that they evaluated. It's a very imperfect methodology, but certainly thought provoking. So the figure on the bottom left is just one example of how a battery or how a generator can uh, malfunction that I helped manage last year. This is a pacemaker, not a defibrillator, but it's the same basic idea. The device was implanted in 2019 and from a test uh, done in the office a few years later, it was projected to have about 10 years of battery life left. And that usually holds, um, holds true. But in this case, there was a very unusual method of battery decline, which could happen very, very suddenly. Usually it declines very slowly over years. And you know about it months, if not longer in advance, when you need to replace somebody's battery through a relatively straightforward surgical procedure. And in this case, because of a manufacturing defect, the battery would drain sort of on that usual level, and then it would just plummet. And it would drop so quickly that you would lose the ability to monitor patients remotely, which is something I'll talk a bit more about in a minute. Um, but in this case, the patient's device went from pacing him normally, and he was dependent on it for every heartbeat, to not only not pacing him at all, but it passed through the ability to actually even send us alert warnings that the device was no longer functioning. Um, we'll talk more about that patient in a minute, but that's an example of one of the more dramatic ways in which a generator can fail. 
Um, so hopefully the clinical context here makes a little bit more sense. And, and again, I'm not scaring anybody, I hope. Uh, these are amazing devices. They work almost always as they are intended to. And, and if you or a loved one has a clinical need for a defibrillator or a pacemaker, you are almost always better off with the device than not. Um, I also don't have any particularly strong feelings about one or another manufacturer. Um, we'll talk about that again towards the end, um, but they all are subject to recalls over the years. Um, and I think they all have similar sort of risk management programs at the corporate level for managing potential issues. They all have independent scientific advisory boards, for example. Usually these things work, but occasionally uh, they go awry. And so when they do, I want to talk a little about how we communicate those known and potential malfunctions to patients. And, and in particular, how do we explain that in the context of an already fairly crowded informed consent discussion and even these longitudinal care visits that are increasingly time pressured? And what do we do when something actually does happen to a patient like the case I just described? I think it's worth noting that the, the context for how we counsel patients about this category of device failure and adverse event, um, it, it's, it's already um, under the shadow a little bit, I guess, of my specialty having received maybe more than its fair of scrutiny about how we talk to patients in general about what we're doing. So several years ago, the Department of Justice investigated um, hundreds of hospitals in the US uh, related to implantation patterns with the suggestion being that we were implanting um, uh, cardiac devices, including defibrillators, sort of outside of clinical guidelines. And there was uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in fines that were issued as a result. And, and several academic groups have actually sort of studied the impact of that DOJ investigation. And maybe because of this, Medicare, which bears the financial burden for most defibrillator implantation in the U.S., uh, issued a, what they call a coverage memo a few years ago, sort of looking to buttress the consent process around which uh, patients agree to go forward with most kinds of defibrillator implants. And what they said is we want to ensure that patients receive more information than just the risks and benefits, sort of a typical surgical consent, you know, bleeding, infection, pain, that sort of stuff. And they said they want to have a shared decision-making encounter as a critical step in empowering patient choices in their treatment plan. And the CMS noted that you know, defibrillators are a common treatment. It's been around for many years, but the strength of evidence for defibrillators is, differs for varying patient populations, which is true, although hard to communicate to patients. And they kind of landed on this policy prescription that has the force of law saying that a formal fair decision-making encounter must occur between patients and a physician or, or a qualified practitioner using an evidence-based decision tool on ICDs prior to initial ICD implantation. And that would be great if there were a lot of evidence-based decision tools, but there actually aren't. Uh, and I've, been, I've worked with some of the groups like from the University of Colorado that have tried to develop these. And there are evidence-based ones in the sense that there have been decision support tools that have been studied, there haven't been any that have been really proven robustly to improve either the patient or provider experience of living with a defibrillator. So a, a bit of a um, unfunded mandate or sort of willing the ends without the means on behalf of Medicare, and it remains a point of contention um, in our field. But it, it's in that context that I, I think it's worth noting, there's really only so many things you can talk to patients about in advance. And sure, just as an example, we've already been asked, as, you, as I showed, to participate in a more robust shared decision-making encounter where we're eliciting patients' healthcare goals, their preferences, their values, and how and whether a defibrillator fits into that picture. But should we also sort of try to fit into that conversation things about software recalls or cybersecurity, for example? So I, mean, I was involved in some work a few years ago in partnership with several computer scientists that we felt compelled to do because a hedge fund, some of you may remember this about five years ago, a hedge fund tried to sort a medical device company by putting out claims uh, related to vulnerabilities in their wireless communication from their devices. So all defibrillators and most pacemakers can communicate wirelessly and they send us clinical information that way, which is very handy. This is also um, a plot point in the show Homeland uh, in season two, although even by that uh, show's standards, it was not a particularly plausible one. Um, but in any event, we did some work testing sort of these reported vulnerabilities and, and I did some follow-up writing that sort of explored whether this kind of information around software malfunction, cybersecurity issues related to the transmission of data between patients and clinicians, is that something that we could possibly incorporate into pre-procedure counseling? But the weeds here are really hard because alongside all the other things patients really care about, which is like, what's wrong with their heart? Why do they need devices in the first place? It's very difficult to figure out kind of where a risk is abstract as a potential future recall, whether it's cybersecurity related or otherwise, how does that rank? along all the other things that patients or their families really want to hear about in the short time that we usually have 
to talk to them about their procedure. So we're really left with at the pre-implant visit, uh, you know, repeated at the follow-up visits, ideally, that incorporates sort of all categories of potential device malfunction, maybe including software or other sorts of more obscure recalls. And we say something like, it's unlikely that your device will malfunction year to year. It's maybe a fraction of a percent per year. It can be hard to predict. The low risk, it's not zero, but it's low. And overall, we tell patients we still think the device is right for you, but it's, it's tricky, to, I think, to strike the right balance there. So what do we do when something does go wrong and there's a, a advisory or recall issued at sufficient scale that we then have to sort of formally notify all of our patients? And one of my administrative roles at my hospital is to draft these letters with input from legal and billing and all the other people who weigh in on this sort of stuff and then help send these out to patients, usually before we make phone calls. And, and I'll, I'll let you folks read this yourselves, but I'll just sort of highlight that there's obviously some stock language here about um, you know, our uh, core institutional and organizational values. And then we try to explain in as clear a language as possible, what is wrong? Like, what is this recall about? There's a small chance that we try to use simple and round numbers to explain what the chance is of their device being affected and whether that would affect them and what the issue actually is. And then we try to outline as clearly as possible what the steps are to, that we might take to do about it. We try to be clear about who's responsible for what in that, um, in that sort of pathway. And these come up about once a year. There's another one that was issued like two weeks ago and we're now circulating the letter explaining what we're gonna do and which patients need a letter, which patients need a letter plus a phone call, which patients need a letter, a phone call and a special visit. Um, each advisory or recall is a little bit different. So I'd be interested, and maybe we'll have time at the end to hear what people think about whether this is readable or not. Um, on, in general, they are not. Um, and so this has been studied. So the bioethics group at the Mayo Clinic led by Paul Mueller and others there have studied this. And so that they looked at a draft of a couple dozen dear patient letters that were drafted by the manufacturers themselves. So they provide us some of this documentation if we wanna use it before we send things out to patients on our own. And what they mapped here was sort of the recommended readability, which is this line of what in general you would want patients to be able to uh, understand when you're sending them clinical documentation of this type. They compared that to the average US reading level, which is somewhat higher. And then they mapped that to the readability of all these advisory letters, which as you can see are clearly basically incomprehensible to anybody. Um, what do patients want for their communication? So I'm sure they would start by wanting letters that they can understand, uh, but the same group with, led by Dr. Mueller and um, Abby Ottenberg, his assistant there, looked at more of a focus group level understanding of you know, what are patients who've been actually subject to these advisories, what do, they, what do they feel about it? What do they want from all the different stakeholders that are involved? And it's important to note that this study was about, you know, this was 10 or so years ago, so it predated what I think has really changed about the way patients learn about these advisories, so certainly they get it from the, from the popular media, they do hear about it from their clinicians eventually, but more of them are learning about it from internet sources and social media, and I think we've learned uh, through the pandemic, if it wasn't already obvious, that that's not a reliable source of information about things that can be this nuanced. But I thought this was sort of interesting. So patients unsurprisingly did want to learn about advisories from their physicians, not from the news or from elsewhere. Um, I think one of the interesting lessons for me from these focus groups is that patients' families are affected by this at all. It's a huge burden on caregivers to know that their loved ones are living with the devices potentially malfunctioning or might malfunction in the future. Um, they had some harsh words for the uh, manufacturers, although it's interesting that they talk about the people sort of in charge of that, but patients very rarely carry a lot of vitriol for specific industry uh, partners. So I've almost never, I've implanted you know, hundreds and hundreds of these devices and almost never do patients ask for a specific brand unless they have a relative usually who works for one of them. And even after they've had a advisory or a recall, including one significant enough to require a second surgery, it's pretty uncommon for patients to say, you know, when you remove my wire and you put a new one in, can you switch to a different brand? Um, we talk about it if they don't bring it up, but it's very unusual for a patient actually to request a different brand. I think that's interesting compared to other contexts where we think about recalls, uh, and maybe it's another way in which the healthcare market is not a real market, right? It's not a marketplace like any other. Uh, all right. What do we say to individual patients who are actually harmed? And so this is that case I alluded to earlier uh, 
where a patient had a battery um, malfunction in his pacemaker that uh, didn't kill him, but could have. And in this case, as I mentioned before, the battery decline was so abrupt that it went past the point in which it was able to send wireless signals, which would have warned us that he needed an urgent generator replacement. It went past that and then basically just stopped working. And so he was at home and he felt dizzy, he called for his wife who took his pulse and found his heart rate was in the 30s and then took him to the closest emergency room where fortunately he was stable enough to have an urgent procedure. Um, so he survived, had no serious consequences of this, um, of this experience. But one of my roles at my hospital, I'll be interested to hear from folks at the end at, at how your institutions handle this. Uh, one of my roles is to sort of serve as like the, the cleanup crew or the fixer for sensitive patient circumstances where there's been some kind of adverse event related to the cardiac arrhythmia service uh, and complain to our patient relations team. Although in this case, the patient didn't complain. He just handled this with remarkable stoicism actually. But I heard about the case and so I set up a phone consultation proactively with the patient and his wife, and I looped in our patient relations staff um, just to help kind of um, shepherd the experience and make sure that the patient's needs were being met. And this is sort of what we talked about. We, we spent about an hour on the phone and sort of outlining his experience with the pacemaker up to this point, how the event manifested, and then what his experience was like with the surgery. I had also talked to the folks who had done his um, or emergent replacement at their local hospital. Uh, we, you know, we, I documented here sort of the usual things that you would do in a circumstance like this was just sort of let the patient vent a little bit if they wanted to vent, um, answer their questions about the technical details as best as I could or at the limits of their interest. And what was particularly interesting to me is that this patient and his wife were very savvy. They were, didn't have medical backgrounds, but, um, but they really understood that the purpose of remote monitoring, of having the system in place at home to rely wireless transmissions to the clinic's office was to prevent exactly this, was so that we could know before his device suddenly failed. And so they asked some hard questions that I actually couldn't entirely answer about why that wasn't effective here. Uh, and, and this is actually something I've focused a lot of my research on over the last few years with help of these fantastic trainees in a, a series of uh, projects that looked at the different sort of ethical and policy and, and clinical manifestations of how remote monitoring has become embedded in clinical care for all kinds of patients, uh, not just cardiac ones, but in other care areas as well, such as diabetes and um, sleep disordered breathing and, and many neurologic conditions. And one of the common threads that kind of emerges in all of these analyses is that this, is, this technology, this ability to wirelessly remotely follow people, increasingly through their phones actually as well, is that the technology kind of often over promises a certain level of security and safety that's just not realistic. And while it does work incredibly well, and it's certainly better than not having it for most patients, we have to be realistic, and I think more honest with patients than we've been traditionally in the past. So remote monitoring of a defibrillator, for example, is not the same as being on real-time telemetry in the hospital. It's just not. And, and even that, as you, many of you may know, that gets missed from time to time too, but these signals are um, processed promptly, but not immediately. And that's an important limitation that many patients, I think, don't understand. Uh, th there's another problem about how remote monitoring is employed, though, and, it, and this is important for defibrillators and pacemaker patients because that's usually the applied remedy whenever there's a recall or advisory issue about battery life or a software problem or even wire malfunction. Usually the answer is not to prophylactically replace a device before it actually malfunctions. Usually the answer is just to monitor patients very closely. And so just as my patient asked, sort of, is there something else we could be doing to monitor patients more effectively? Well, we're certainly monitoring them more intensely. So these devices, it turns out, are increasingly uh, embedded and packed with sort of sensors and other data collection methods and algorithms that are now pretty far afield from the primary reason why the device is there. So a typical pacemaker or defibrillator now, for example, can measure patients' physical activity, can listen to your heart sounds, it can detect ambient arrhythmias. They usually can measure uh, something called transthoracic impedance, which is like a proxy for your fluid status. It can translate all these things into various autonomic measures to sort of see how your autonomic nervous system is tuned up. And this is still um, nascent, but it's something that uh, one of my fellows and I wrote about recently, which is there's a, an early interest in not just collecting all of this information from patients and their devices at home, but pushing some information back out. So doing in even very limited or controlled context, uh, remote reprogramming of the way a pacemaker or defibrillator is set to care for a patient 
without having to bring them into the office. I don't anticipate this happening at scale or, or really being involved in uh, widespread clinical use anytime soon, but it is something that at least theoretically could be done. Um, and it, I think, speaks to sort of this challenge that we continue to um, confront in this space, which is we're collecting so much information and so much of it is increasingly tangential or at least bestride the primary device feature that it, I think, introduces potential new liability risks, might be confusing to patients, and it introduces a, a lot of noise while potentially obscuring the real signals that we care about. Just to you know, illustrate this um, another way, and, and my views on this have really been informed by an ongoing collaboration with a group called the Hearts and Minds Lab at Imperial College in London. And, and this group um, studies digital health and remote connectivity in a way that we, we always remind ourselves as we're thinking about new things that we wanna put the technology first. Uh, uh, we, want, we wanna avoid putting the technology first rather than the patient needs, because that's, I think, what happens um, all too often with the way the sensors and the data collection capability expands so rapidly. And so just as an example of this, this is sort of just, uh, just a sampling, sadly, of the various fitness apps that I have on my phone. Uh, and they collect all kinds of data and they process all sorts of things, some of which is useful, like you know what my pace is when I'm running, what my heart rate is doing, uh, what my run cadence is, which is sort of a thing you can get interested in. A lot of the rest of this, I have no idea what it means. Um, and I'm relatively interested in this stuff. So I don't know what, how Garmin decides what my performance condition is. I don't know what form power is. That's some proprietary thing that's sort of uninterpretable probably unless you work for the company. Uh, ground time, this is measuring in like the thousandth of second how long each uh, footfall stays on the ground. I'm impressed that that can be measured. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that. And that, well, that's fine. This is just my watch and you know my running around. But if you superimpose this on somebody's heart, Right? We're really dedicating a lot of time, a lot of energy, and real resources towards collecting huge amounts of information, much of which is not obviously useful um, or certainly not clearly worth it uh, in proportion to the effort it takes to process all of that noise to find the signal. Uh, so last thing I want to talk about is who takes responsibility for problems when they happen. And that we've heard, as I mentioned, from focus groups and elsewhere, and certainly clinically from patients, that they do want manufacturers and their clinicians to work together when something does go wrong. And as clinicians, we, we have a role, of course, in contacting patients and being proactive to manage the complications related to the devices that we've implanted. We should probably do a better job than we do counseling patients before they undergo these surgeries. And certainly after if something happens, we need to be available, however imperfectly, um, and, and preserve a therapeutic relationship because these are lifelong commitments typically living with these devices. But there are, I think, some real gaps in the current system that bear mentioning, and I'd be very interested in people's feedback um, towards the end. And so just as an example of how it might work, so you know, last year, let's, let's, uh, late last year, as some of you may know, Eliud Kipchoge, who's a Kenyan marathoner, broke his own world record in the Berlin Marathon. And about an hour and a half later, looking somewhat less celebratory, I crawled over the finish line. And then shortly after that, my watch broke. And it just, I don't know, the battery wouldn't work, it wouldn't charge, it wouldn't do anything. And I emailed Garmin, heard back within a day, and they sent me a brand new watch. That's great. That, you know, that's um, how it should work. And actually, a month or so after that, I was riding my road bike, and my handlebars suddenly sort of disconnected from the rest of the bike, and I nearly crashed um, into a bus. And uh, I was fine, and I sort of screwed the whole thing back together and rode back to the rest of my house. And I figured it turned out that Cervelo, which is a Canadian company that makes my road bike, issued a recall. And there was a problem with the what's called the faceplate, which is what sort of holds your handlebars to the rest of your bike. And they recalled it and they uh, paid for a new piece and they paid for the service at your local bike shop to have the whole thing taken care of. Didn't cost me a penny and was maybe lucky not to be injured. But the experience of this recall, I think, is more like what most of us expect when a product that we're using is subject to a recall. That's what companies are supposed to do. They sort of take over for it. Well, what happens when a defibrillator is recalled? Not exactly the same. This was an attempt to model the cost just to Medicare, which is the largest, but certainly not the only insurer responsible for the cost of managing patients with defibrillators. Uh, and this was in response to the first recall that I described um, some uh, minutes ago, this uh, wire that was fracturing at a higher than expected rate. And if you look toward, down towards the bottom, there's obviously a wide um, range in their estimates, but it could be as low as still a, several hundred million dollars or as high as in the low billions, just for managing sort of the initial um, 
and short, relatively short-term experience of these patients. So that's included things like electively replacing devices, uh, handling the consequences that might have manifested more clinically, and so on and so forth. And you amplify this by the millions of patients living with these devices, some of whom will be subject to these kinds of advisories. The total burden to Medicare alone each year probably still is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And if you think about all the other insurers that are involved here and the patient's experiences themselves, uh, there's a lot of money that is being uh, a, a large financial burden shifted to insurers predominantly demand these sort of things. So it's not the case that manufacturers necessarily take all this burden on themselves as they do for maybe uh, fitness equipment. So what are the different kinds of costs that we're thinking about? So there's certainly the procedural costs. If somebody needs a new procedure, uh, urgently or otherwise, there are professional and technical reimbursement costs. These can run into the tens, if not uh, low hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the circumstances. It's usually covered by insurance if you're fortunate enough to have it. Um, but of course, as you know, there's a lot of gaps there, and depending on individual patient circumstances, there might be an out-of-pocket responsibility there. And that, that, that doesn't cover transportation to and from additional visits, parking, which in Boston is a big deal, um, the additional fees for those visits, co-payments, and so forth. Uh, as I mentioned, most cardiac device advisories include as part of the management plan uh, additional remote monitoring, and that is not free. That also gets charged to insurance, but in many cases, patients actually bear a burden for that as well. One of the huge costs that's not well studied, that we have a grant under review now that is a, an attempt to characterize it more quantitatively, is the burden on institutions like mine to manage an advisory. So every time a new advisory is issued, I have to draft a letter, we have to work with our device clinic staff to figure out which of our patients are affected. We have to contact a lot of those patients. There's new appointments that put a burden on our administrative staff for scheduling. And all of that is just hugely time consuming. And none of that is reimbursed in any particularly uh, substantive way by the manufacturers or otherwise. And then sort of this is more abstract, but to the extent that we have to dedicate our limited time to these additional activities to manage a recall, that's time that we've taken away from other patients, and we might even have to bump patients from a scheduling a scheduled procedure to make room for these urgent cases if somebody does need to have an emergency replacement. So you know, there's lots of different stakeholders involved. There's insurers, Medicare certainly, uh, and and the uh, state public health equivalents, as well as private insurers, clinicians, there's patients, manufacturers do bear some responsibility for this. And, and I don't want to be unfair to the vendors here. Uh, if we do have to replace the device under advisory, we get the new one for free, um, which is to say that rather than an institution having to buy a new defibrillator generator that we would then implant if we had to explant one because of a recall, uh, we get that unit without having to pay for it additionally. That, of course, commits you to use that same manufacturer, which is another uh, maybe uh, peculiarity to the healthcare market. But that is a cost that the manufacturers do bear. Patients do get a lot of this burden, though, one way or the other. And I, I, I could see this in different ways. You could view, like, from the perspective of putting most of the burden on insurance companies, which is really where it generally rests, is that it's a known, if imperfectly, imperfectly predictable you know, cost of doing business. If you're an insurer, who provides health insurance coverage uh, to these devices, then you know that's defensible, I guess, uh, to say that that's where the financial responsibility should rest. It's a bummer for patients with high out-of-pocket costs, though, and it also sort of to the rest of us because then we have to pay higher premiums as a result. Uh, another view might be that manufacturers ought to bear more of that financial risk, and, and of course they could reinsure that some other way, and they may or may not have to pass those costs onto us by just making the devices more expensive. Um, that would functionally be probably pretty similar to the first idea where in having insurance companies do it. It's hard to know because of all the different layers that obscure the true cost of healthcare in the United States. Um, institutions are going to still be left in the cold there, right? Because when my staff put in extra hours to contact all these patients or set up additional clinics, as we're doing for the most recent um, advisory, they don't usually get additional reimbursement for that. And it's a lot of uh, time from a staff that's already actually quite stressed. So it's hard to think about who and how we would exclude from the financial burden here. I don't really know what the right answer is. I'm still kind of workshopping some ideas and thinking about a framework that would try to be more definitive about where this responsibility ultimately should rest. Um, and so hopefully I've shed a little bit of light on these different topics for a device area where maybe you haven't spent a lot of time thinking. So these are, as I said, they're really extraordinary devices. They're life-saving, they're life-sustaining for millions of patients, but they do sometimes let us and our patients down. How we talk about that, I think, is complicated. It's still not well worked out. 
And then again, ultimately the responsibility for this uh, unfortunately inevitable part of modern device-based medical care, uh, I think remains very much a work in progress. So just the last thing I'll say is, again, millions of patients live with these devices. I'm glad that they do. I'm glad that they work as well as they do and that we have the industry partners we do to develop this technology. Right? Without the manufacturers, I would have nothing to do on my procedural days. They work so well that they're nearly invisible most of the time, which is great, but it makes it hard to remember, I think sometimes as clinicians or maybe as patients, to think about the possibility of device malfunction and then to manage it proactively when it does happen. I think there's some limited opportunities in, in my specialty in particular to incorporate the idea of future potential malfunction more effectively into our pre-implantation counseling, just to have um, patients know what we're getting them into uh, and how we're gonna get them through that together, but it's hard to do it well. And some of those challenges are just, how do you communicate a risk that's hypothetical and probably rare, but if it happened, it would be serious. I, I don't know the right way to do that. I, I think I do it pretty well, but it's hard to know. Um, how do you counsel and count comfort patients who've actually experienced these events? That's uncommon, but it does happen, and it's something that my specialty struggles with. And again, as we collect more and more information from these patients, I think striking the right balance between collecting information in a way that serves patients' interests effectively, makes their life with these devices safer, um, that's hard to do. And I think we have to make sure that we're putting patient needs before the technology. And then again, who pays for all this? It's right now, we all do in some ways that are obvious and other ways that maybe are less obvious and just obscured by the different layers in our system. Uh, so just thank you all for your attention. Thank you for the invitation to participate in this webinar. And thanks, of course, to my wonderful collaborators, both in Boston at the Smith Center, don't here, as well as Imperial College London at the Hearts and Minds Lab. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. That was fascinating and thought-provoking. Um, we have a few questions that came in, if you wanted to take a look at those, some questions and comments. Sure. Um, so the, the first question is um, asking sort of whether patients can, can see or access the remote monitoring data that is collected. Uh, and, you know, and it's proposed that you know, these are people presumably who would really, they're like the stakeholder who would have the most interest in that information. Um, and the answer is sort of yes and sort of no. And it depends on a, a little bit on how that patient accesses their medical data in general. So because of sort of the open notes uh, program and so the re resulting legislation that many of you may be familiar with, Patients have a legal right to access their medical records, and to the extent that their remote monitoring data enters their traditional medical record, whether it's you know Epic-based or whatever, and so it, and can be viewed through their patient portals, then yes, they can look at it. They can't see usually the same level of detail that their cardiologist can. And one of the things that's um, frustrating for a lot of patients, particularly the more technologically inclined ones, and for patients for for physicians too, and it's something that my group is sort of working on, is when patients uh, relay information to us through their phones, which increasingly pacemakers and some defibrillators are able to do, the app that they use as that relay station, uh, it doesn't tell patients much. It, it could, right? It could tell them like your battery is fine, your wires are fine, uh, you're not having any new arrhythmias or anything else of concern. But in general, it doesn't provide that feedback in anything like real time or at all. Um, and I've been working with a group that's based in France, so they have a, a U.S. presence as well, that has piloted some limited delivery back to patients of more information about their systems and really about their own health. Uh, but that's kind of early days for this, and I think it's something that I hope becomes more common in the future, because I think it would be, would go a long way towards empowering patients um, uh, with you know, living with these devices and just giving them more information. Um, there was a related question that um, came up about you know, related to tracking patients and their devices through their medical records. And, and the suggestion was that the uh, initiative that the FDA has issued its rule on some years ago, but has sort of imperfectly implemented in clinical care, uh, something called the UDI or the unique device identifier uh, mandate. And so the idea here is that every defibrillator wire or battery has a unique device identifier that is uh, more helpful than just the serial number, which of course is already etched on all these devices. It's a way that tracks sort of the device type, the model, and links it to a particular procedure and an episode of care and to that patient sort of in perpetuity. Um, and the short answer is yes, that would be incredibly helpful to be able to do larger scale research about which patients have which devices and what's working and not working, um, but we, we don't have them. 
uh, just yet. It's sort of lagged for multiple reasons. I think there was a paper issued this week from, um, I think it was from the UCSF group, just commenting on how many class one, sort of the uh, class three rather, the highest risk kinds of devices that we use, how many of those uh, actually have UDIs embedded as the legislation was intended. And it's a, a relatively small fraction. Um, let's see, we have time for a few more questions. So another point was made that uh, warranties might help, which is sort of interesting. That, that, was, that certainly helped with my uh, Garmin watch and with my Cervelo road bike, uh, both of which were replaced for free. I think not just because, at least in the case of the bike, I nearly died because of the problem, but because um, it was a relatively new purchase, so it was still under warranty. So devices do have warranties, um, but that is the mechanism by which an institution that needs to do a second procedure because a device malfunctions doesn't have to pay for a new generator, which is like in the thousands of dollars, depending on the model. Um, if it was, if it's being replaced because of an advisory or recall, or if it just didn't last as long as it was supposed to. Um, so there is a, that sort of limited application of a warranty. And to some extent that extends to patients too. Uh, you know, to be um, uh, you know, to be fair to the manufacturers, they do provide some limited out-of-pocket relief to patients. It can be clunky to access it, but you can do it up to, it depends on the manufacturer and it depends on the recall, but we've had patients who've been able to access those um, reimbursement fees up to like $500 to $1,000 or so, depending on the episode. So that's sort of warranty-like, um, but it's... Um, it requires some healthcare navigation skills and certainly some wherewithal on the part of the patients to take advantage of it. So uh, whether a more robust warranty-like system might um, shift more of that financial responsibility to manufacturers, for example, for the facility fees, like so if somebody gets a defibrillator implanted just electively, the physicians get a small um, you know, uh, amount of the total proportion of cost for that episode of care. Most of the money goes to the institution. Uh, and that is not covered by these warranties. Um, all right, um, here's a question. So this is, uh, sounds like a tough case. So elderly patients pacemakers stop working within hours after a test performed at the facility by the pacemakers manufacturer's rep. And during resuscitations, the patients had many broken ribs, which is, is unfortunately relatively common uh, if you're doing CPR properly. Uh, before this event, the patient had lived an active and independent life, but afterwards was unable to resume his activities. Could this be handled through the hospital's CRP or uh, communication resolution program? Uh, from my perspective, and my hospital has a, a, such a program, and this is definitely the kind of case where I would, whether I, I was that patient's doctor or not, I would get involved as sort of that cleanup crew. Uh, yes, this seems like the case where you would do as much due diligence as you could possibly do to figure out what happened and whether that testing from the manufacturer's uh, representative had anything to do with the device suddenly failing. Um, it's hard to think about how that might happen, but it's certainly possible. Uh, so you would have to be as proactive as possible. And you could imagine this being a circumstance where what the patient wants to hear from their doctors and from the other parties involved in their care, it, it's not just about money. It's not just about being compensated for a perceived injury. It's they want to pre presumably understand what happened, how, if it was an error on the part of that manufacturer representative, for example, who are usually extremely good at what they do, but mistakes can happen. Um, they'd wanna hear how that error could be prevented from happening again. And they most likely wanna hear apologies from the people involved and sort of understand the system that allowed this to happen. At least that's been my experience. But yes, that would be a case where it's such an abrupt and unexpected finding that I think reaching out proactively would go a long toward, way towards meeting those patients' needs and potentially, potentially protecting the institution from tort liability as well. Um, this is an interesting question. Uh, so it's posed as, I wonder how device malfunctions impact the doctor-patient relationship. Do patients experience device failure as a shortcoming of the manufacturer or the physician? And do patients see manufacturers and physicians as the same in some sense? And the, the challenge is, how do you, as a physician, maintain and cultivate trust with patients despite these unreliable devices? Um, that's a good question. Uh, and assuming that the adverse event, if one emerges, 
is definitely a device malfunction that wasn't related to the implant, right? If it was, if I made a mistake, if I did something that caused the complication, that's not usually the manufacturer's fault, that's my fault. And I have to address it as such. But if, if you're thinking about a case like these devices that have been implanted for years and then suddenly experience uh, adverse event because of a manufacturing defect, in my experience, the patients, they never blame their physician and they blame the manufacturers to some extent if they have to place blame on somewhat, someone, but I've, I've actually always been impressed by how uh, stoic patients usually are when this kind of thing happens. And, you know, I'm, I'm relatively young and healthy. I don't live with one of these devices. Um, I do have friends and you know, patients who are my age or younger who do. And I think just needing to live with a device like this changes your perception of that technology a little bit. And I've just been humbled by how, um, how much trust the patients put in these devices and they put in us to pick a device that we think will be sufficiently reliable to sustain these patients' lives. Um, but I very rarely hear patients express anger either at their physicians for having picked one model or another, or even at the manufacturers for, uh, you know, for a mistake having been made. Not to say it doesn't happen, and I'm sure that patients who have, you know, the, the loved ones of patients who have died, as has happened, probably feel very differently about it than the patients who I'm able to talk to and their families. Um, but for the ones who are harmed, but not um, fatally by these sorts of events, I've been surprised by how little vitriol emerges from those conversations. Um, so, and I think there's just time for just one last question. Um, in pre-implantation counseling as a patient, I would want to know the different manufacturers used by my cardiologist and how often recalls are seen for these manufacturers. Uh, you said that the rate is happening uh, you know, uh, you know, relatively low, and it's a reasonable piece of information to provide so that patients can have a more informed decision. Um, does this sound reasonable to me as a practitioner? So it does. I think that uh, patients should know that there are options, certainly. And the devices, while across manufacturers are similar, they're not interchangeable. And so for defibrillators, for example, they're, for pacemakers, they're much, much more similar with very small differences in function. But for defibrillators, there are some differences, one of which is probably um, the best estimates of how long the batteries last under normal conditions. There's some variability across manufacturers there. And so we, when we pick a particular brand, um, I usually make a recommendation, and that's in part because I work in a hospital system that uses all the manufacturers, and we do that intentionally in part to actually not expose us to the risks of only being stuck with one vendor if there is a problem. We use them all four of the major ones that are available on the market in the U.S. And I talk to patients about why this is the brand that I've selected for them today, and I explain to them why I think you know, at your age, the longest battery life possible is probably the most important thing. Um, we talk about other features. There are different uh, defibrillators actually have very slightly different shapes. And so depending on the size of the patient and exactly some of the other implant concerns that we might be trying to do for cosmetic reasons, I might choose one or another manufacturer for that reason. Um, but the question is a good one. Yes, we should be explaining this routinely to patients and uh, they shouldn't just find out after the fact, like, oh, I have an Abbott device or a Medtronic device or Biotronic. There should, I think, be room in that pre-implantation discussion for some uh, information about which device they're having, why I think it's the right one for them. And of course, if they have strong views about it one way or the other, then they're certainly welcome to um, report back. The, the rate of recall though, and rate of device failure across the manufacturers, as best as I can tell, is about the same. So that, generally speaking, does not factor in. They've all had advisories over the years. They've all had issues with their wires. And the systems we use now are all pretty good and I think pretty much the same. So with that, I mean, Paulina, I'll let you wrap up, but thanks again for inviting me and, and, um, and letting me be a part of this webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Kramer. That was, that was fascinating. I certainly learned a lot. Um, so we will post the recording of this webinar on our website um, and we'll keep you updated on future webinars. And thank you all for joining. And, and again, thank you, Dr. Kramer.